The inflation peaked around 9%, but it has been coming down. It's still too high. It's still way above the Fed's target. They say we want 2%, but I've never felt that 2% was the right target for inflation. I always thought it should be zero. If you believe in price stability, you wouldn't want any inflation and you wouldn't want any deflation. You would want price stability. Now, of course, you're never going to get it exactly there, but the target in that world would be zero, maybe a little bit below, a little bit above, but you'd always be steering to zero. That means you're not stealing anyone's money through inflation. You're not enriching creditors through deflation. You're not distorting the allocation of capital by either one. You're just saying we want stable money. That's kind of the Fed's job. Then the question is, why is it 2%? And you know, I disagree with Milton Friedman on a lot of things, but Milton Friedman said zero. He didn't think it should be 2%. He thought zero is the right number. I agree with that. So why is it 2%? Well, the Fed has a rationale. Um, the rationale is every now and then you have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, bail out the stock market. You just need a rate cut. And the evidence is pretty good that negative rates don't work. They have been tried for years in Japan, Switzerland, uh, I believe Sweden for a while, um, and, and the ECB, uh, but they don't do anything. They don't uh, stimulate. In fact, they often do the opposite of what they're intended to do. Let me give you a, a concrete example. So the idea is if I cut interest rates you know, lower and lower, as a saver or an investor, I'm going to say, well, I don't like those low yields. Um, you know, I put money in the bank, I only get you know, a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or whatever. So I'll go buy some treasury notes or I'll go buy some stocks. And that's called the portfolio channel effect. In other words, by keeping rates so low, you make simple savings and liquid investments unattractive and you drive investors to other investments, housing, stocks, bonds, whatever, commodities perhaps. And then that creates a wealth effect. And if my assets go up, I feel more prosperous. And maybe I spend more money and that helps the economy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the theory. It's all garbage, by the way. There's, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. I mean, yeah, assets go up, people feel a little better about it. But the idea that they turn around and spend more money does not hold up. Uh, the people with the most assets tend to have the most discretionary income. And, you know, once you got a couple of cars and a couple of houses, you know, and a, a decent wardrobe, you're actually going to go spend more money. Well, probably not. You'll probably save it or invest it. I'm not saying those are bad things, but the idea that it stimulates the economy is not true. But if you follow the theory and say, okay, lower rates force you into to asset purchases, et cetera, wouldn't negative rates do even more of that? Because what's, what happens with a negative rate? You have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at a negative one percent interest rate, I take on the on the government or the treasury or the bank, I'm taking a thousand dollars a year. I'm taking one percent out of your account. So you're sitting there. You just say, hey, I just want to save a hundred thousand dollars. That's all I want. But with a negative rate, it goes 99, 98, 97. And the idea there is, well, now you're really going to spend your money because it's kind of use it or lose it. Again, these are the kind of theories, but let me kind of ground that in the real world a little bit. What do people actually think? When they see negative rates, they, people say to themselves, huh, there must be deflation coming. You know, the economy must be in really bad shape. Deflation must be getting the upper hand. Why else would they go to negative rates if they weren't worried about deflation? And if they are worried about deflation, and they are, then I'm going to save more. Far from getting people to spend, uh, remember the dollar is worth more in a deflationary world. Your dollars are actually worth more. In real terms, a dollar can be you're just a bank account can be your best performing investment in a deflationary world. If if you have two percent deflation, then the real value of a, a savings account with zero interest goes up two percent, and that's probably better than what stocks are doing in that world. So people act rationally. They say, okay, we have negative rates. Central bank must be worried about deflation. If they're worried, I'm worried. And I'm going to say more because, first of all, those savings will do well in deflation. Uh, you know, I need, I need to be prepared for that. Last thing I want to do is spend. If prices are going down, why would I spend? I'll wait six months to get a cheaper price. So, in other words, real world behavior is the exact opposite of what central bankers predict. Central bankers predict use it or lose it. You'll go spend the money because I'm going to take it away. But real people say, no, I'm going to say more because you're signaling to me that the value of the money is going up because you're worried about deflation and prices are coming down. So what's the rush? So for all those reasons, negative rates don't work. Now, in theory, cutting rates from five to four to three to two down to zero does perhaps have some stimulative effect, not as much as people think. Uh, and so the Fed says, well, we don't want to start with zero. If we start with zero, if that's our target and negative doesn't work, 
and the economy goes into a recession, how do we stimulate the economy? We can't go below zero, but we can't cut rates because we're at zero. So they believe that they ought to keep rates around 2%. Now, as inflation is about 2%, interest rates are about 2%. And that gives you two points of cuts. You could do in 25 basis point rate cuts, you could do eight cuts. You know, it's a full year of rate cuts from you know, two to one and three quarters, one and a half, one and a quarter, et cetera. You can do eight 25 basis point rate cuts with 2%. So the Fed says our target rate is 2% because we need a little cushion in case we have to cut. And if we're at zero, we don't have a cushion we can't cut. That's what they say. The reality is the following. Uh, and the way I explain this, it's like a little kid, like a nine-year-old kid, and his, his mother leaves her purse around. And the kid goes in the purse and sees there's $50 in the purse. And he says, well, even an eight-year-old say, well, if I steal the $50, mom's going to catch me and I'm going to be in trouble. But if I take a couple bucks, she won't notice. Like, she's not counting the dollars every day. And the Fed's idea is if I steal 2% from you, you won't notice. 10%? Yeah, you'll be up in arms. You'll be driving tractors up the steps of the Fed the way they did in 1980. But 2%, you kind of won't notice. Well, what's the math of 2%? Well, 2% cuts the value of the dollar in half in 35 years. It cuts it in half again in another 35 years. Bear in mind, you're starting from down half. So in a typical lifetime of 70 years, at 2%, the dollar is going to lose 75% of its purchasing power. So in 70 years, typical lifetime, your dollar loses 75% of its purchasing power at 2%. And that's really the point, because 2% year in, year out, probably not enough to feel, but it's insidious. And by doing it for a long enough period of time, you destroy the purchasing power of the dollar. And that's what they really want to do. Why? Because the federal debt is nominal. The debt is nominal. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. Whether in real terms, it's a dollar five or 95 cents, that's separate, but I owe you the buck. Well, if you can destroy the purchasing power of the dollar, you're actually reducing the real value of the debt. People say America has never defaulted on its debt. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I destroyed the value of the dollar. Now, 3% will do it in about 23 years, which means that you'll destroy 75% of the purchasing power in 46 years, not 70 years. If so on 4%, 5%, et cetera. At 10%, you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. People like to bang the table and say, you know, since, since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious, it is a tax. It in conclusion, the journey to understanding inflation, the Federal Reserve's targets, and the impact on the economy reveals some profound insights. While the Fed aims for a 2% inflation rate to maintain a buffer for potential economic downturns, the argument for zero inflation presents a compelling case for true price stability. Negative interest rates, often seen as a tool for stimulating the economy, can backfire by promoting deflationary expectations, leading people to save more instead of spending. The historical perspective shows that even modest inflation rates can significantly erode purchasing power over time, effectively acting as a hidden tax. This strategy subtly reduces the real value of debt but at the cost of long-term economic stability and individual savings. Therefore, it's crucial to understand these dynamics and advocate for policies that truly promote stable and sound money, ensuring a fair and predictable economic environment for all. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has provided some valuable insights into the complex world of inflation and monetary policy. If you found this discussion helpful, please like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth analyses and expert interviews.